Okay, so uh, uh, can you just can you just introduce yourself, like who who you are and uh, what it is that you do, please? Yeah, I'm Stefano Rossito, and I'm the author of The End of Glory and Roots in the Sky, and I'm directing, writing, um, drawing, and writing the text and programming the game. So I'm I've got a lot to do <laughs> in this project. Luckily for me, I'm not alone in the project, fortunately. I have two teammates in the main team, Carlo De Renzis and Cristiano Caliendo. They go by the name, they're in touch. And they're the guys behind the Shadows on the Vatican. We're currently working together on the third act of Shadows on the Vatican, so you're going to hear about it in the following months. Cristiano helps me with the text of the game, while Carlo is more of the commercial guy. <laughs> we, are, we are the creative ones, we're always there talking with each other and seeing stuff like wow, this thing is so cool, we need to put it inside our game. And he's like, nope, nope, we can't. It's, we don't have the money. And we're like, oh. <laughs> we also have Michael Weyers on board who is the German translator and also worked on Return to Monkey Island. We have Carlos Valadares as, as a musician. He lives in Madrid and he's, he's, he's sort of this crazy dude which constantly have ideas. I remember when we started work, working on The End of Glory 2, Carlo contacted him and told him, yo, we're doing uh, the sequel to The End of Glory, are you interested? He didn't reply, he disappeared for a couple of hours and then he sent us this this main team <laughs> out of nowhere without telling anyone anything and said, what do you think about it? Is it good? <laughs> and it's the the song you can hear in the in the trailer. Who am I? A dead man walking who decided to become a ghost. And I also met this great artist some years ago, Anton Nugro, who is the responsible for the image that's behind your back at the moment. Right here. And and it's so cool. I, I, I followed him for some months on Instagram and then I decided I want this dude on board. I want him to draw something for the game. Oh, uh, okay. So uh, uh, could you uh, could you explain like what this picture is is of? Well, the background is Japan. You can see Mount Fuji, and there's a strange spacecraft uh, airship in the sky, which is actually based on a real-life project, but I won't talk about it now. And in the front cover, we can see our main duo, Lars and Alice, from the first game, even if they both changed their look somehow. Oh, oh, really? But he he uh, uh, he still he still has the scarf, right? Like that that's kind of his uh, signature look. Yeah, that's his symbol. It's like the the bat for Batman or stuff like that. You will never see Lars without his scarf, I think. Dude, I don't wear the scarf. It's the scarf that wears me. Uh, what's this shadow in the background then? Uh, we can say that he's like the villain of the game <laughs> right <laughs> yeah uh, uh kind of looks like a like a samurai i guess yep yeah, yeah this game is uh is based on a on a japanese legend our main duo will of course visit japan during their investigation and the main villain is of japanese origins and you know i i'm i haven't talked about uh, about him until now uh, but i'm very proud of this character the the villain in the first game radwed was a bit of a stereotype but it was intended uh, to be like that because i wanted pe the people to understand that the real villain of the game wasn't radwed while for this particular game i wanted a villain that was more deep and had a personal backstory, something we can relate to. Oh, uh, uh, okay. So, so, uh, so you already had planned to like make a sequel, like right, like was it during like 
uh, the development of the first game or, or like just right after like when did you decide the story was going to continue I think I, I, I always knew that because I had this plot in mind for the end of glory and the alchemy team and the alchemist and so on but mainly I wanted to talk about Lars and his personal growth during his life and I, I knew right away that one game wouldn't be enough. I needed more space or it'd be rushed up. It would be too in a hurry. I didn't like that. I wanted more space to tell this story of Lars and Alice as well. So I needed right from the beginning that there would be a sequel. I didn't know which legends the sequel would be about because you can imagine there, there will be a legend, a real life legend in the sequel as well. But I had a theme in mind, and if you played the demo, you could guess it. It's the relationship be between a father and a son. What is that makes a father a father? And in this regard, Lars will confront his future, of course, but also his past. And the, char the, the characters he will meet will be like a reflection of himself, like mirrors, including the villain. I wanted to give to make this origin story with Lars and explaining to people why he always wears this, this, this scarf and gloves. Where does it come from? Because believe me, a lot of people ask me this. Why in the world is he wearing a scarf in Miami? <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to talk about that. And I also thought in the first game, we see that he is very uh, he's almost in love with his teddy bear. You can see that he, he remembers, he has fond memories of his teddy bear. So I wanted to give a glimpse into his life uh, with this teddy bear as his imaginary friend. I only hope people will understand that the bear isn't really talking people. I don't know why mom wants me to remove that. It's colorful. A real masterpiece. Isn't it? Do you remember when dad taught us about irony? No. I can tell. Okay, so 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 Lars is is kind of like the hero, but but there's actually kind of there's almost like two main characters, right? So you got Lars and and Alice. You know, uh, when I wrote the first game, Alice uh, originally wasn't that important. It was Cristiano who helped me improve a role in the story. And I'm very happy about it because, you know, uh, a lot of people told me they didn't like Lars because he's weird. He's a really weird character and you can even hate him because he's very characterized. But nobody, up until now at least, told me they didn't like Alice because she's so cute. How can you hate her? And, you know, I think the reason why they work as a couple is because they're very different. On one side we have Lars, which is very strange, introducing himself, shouting his name, is very theatrical. And on the other side we have Alice, who is trying to demonstrate that she is a professional. She really cares about what she's doing. They balance each other, and I think they, they work pretty well. Yeah. Absolute number one, intern. Isn't that because you're playing against yourself, Mr. Number One? If someone had tried socializing rather than carrying around her job, we would not still be here arguing about it. So at the current state of things, I am the undisputed number one, and that's that. I don't care if somebody hates Lars. What I care about is that they don't forget about him. I want them to remember him because if they, if in two years from now they're going to remember Lazarus, it means it works as a character. The fact that somebody could hate him is a risk I'm ready to, to take because um, I think we need to have some courage when writing characters because it's the only way to write a character that you can hope somebody will remember in the future. I, I find it really interesting how you include him in kind of your videos and you, you can kind of like interact with him. So you have this kind of like relationship with the character that you've created. 
You know, when I was writing Lars, uh, um, I was reading this book that's called Cinco Horas con Mario, Five Hours with Mario, which is a book by Miguel de Libes. Now it's very boring. Don't read it. But this was this, this interesting introduction where the author warned the writers to not put too much of themselves into their characters to create some distance between the author and the character. And so I started giving Lars some features that are very distant from myself. Lars is not myself. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, can, you, uh, can you talk about um, the, like the, the new Kickstarter uh, uh, campaign that you have? Yeah, uh, can you talk about how that's gone so far? It's had a great start, to be honest. I I didn't see it, it coming because the first campaign was a bit of a struggle. We were asking for uh, 8,000 euros at the time, and it took us about 16 days to reach the basic goal. For this second campaign, we did the same amount in two days, and, and it's something I really... <laughs> I repeat, I didn't see it coming. It's such a great result. I wasn't expecting this. And I hope we'll keep on going on because I have some cool stretch goals in mind and I want to reach them. And I want to add everything possible into the game and make it the best game I can make. And if you can show yourself in the Kickstarter video, it can be uh, useful, of course. In the first video, we have this sort of double interview between Lars and me and we were interacting with each other even playing rock paper scissors and it was crazy so for this second video I thought what can we do more than that because people loved that video they they they, they wrote to me t telling me whoa I, I backed your project because of that video I even don't know the game and that was so cool, we had to repeat it somehow, but I wanted to do something more, so I, I forced my teammate to do this video with me. So we're going to use last to convince the people to back the sequel? Shall we get back to Broken Sword and Gabriel Knight? Yeah, that's better. Okay, good. So, about the Kickstarter campaign. You can't get rid of me, ingrates. I'm the hero of the Hand of Glory. I am the Hand of Glory. Can you just explain, like, what the Hand of Glory, like, what does that title mean? Like, what exactly is, like, the Hand of Glory? The Hand of Glory is basically a dry, the dried end of a man who died natured, or who was hanged. Allegedly, it was a powerful alchemist artifact. And you, it's a bit creepy. Nobody knows uh, exactly what powers it held, this, power, this end of glory. Somebody said it could immobilize thieves while they try to enter into your house. Somebody else says it was more powerful than that. Um, what we know is we don't know. We don't know anything about it. But that was the starting point because I thought why nobody knows about this legend? And I've always been fascinated with alchemy and alchemists. So that was the starting point. I started from, from that and started doing research. And I ended up talking about Count Cagliostro, a pretty famous alchemist here in Italy also because he died here in Italy, in a small medieval town called San Leo that you visit in the first game. I was immediately enveloped by the medieval atmosphere of San Leo. So you mentioned Broken Sword, and like obviously, I guess like your two main inspirations are Broken Sword and Gabriel Knight. Is it is it like really those two? Now I was ten years old. It was ninety six, and my bigger brother brought this game home. It was Broken Sword, of course. It was a rented copy of Broken Sword. And I already knew the game because I, I, I had this, you know, with the PlayStation, they gave this demo disc with trailers in it. And there was this trailer of Broken Sword. I think it's still the best trailer ever made for an adventure game. And I was mesmerized as a child. I started playing Broken Sword and 
for some reason, it was in Spanish. <laughs> I still don't know why in the world it was in Spanish. I was 10 years old. And now I can talk Spanish. Entiendo un poco de español. But back then, I had 10 years. And I started to play Broken Sword. And I understand half of the things they were saying all of the time. But it was a cartoon. There was this blonde dude hunting a killer apparently a clown killer and i i i reached the hotel ubu i was killed and i was shocked because what in the world just happened i got killed and i didn't save by the way i had to start all over again uh, but i was so captured by the, the the atmosphere of that game by the music the visual and when I saw that game, I instantly knew I was going to do something in my life similar to that. I didn't know back then that I would end up developing a video game, but I wanted to make something similar. And so the idea was born back there in 96. It's only been a matter of times uh, before I actually developed one. Between the first, the end of glory and roots in the sky, five years have, have passed. So. Lots of things have changed. And in that regard, my inspiration is mainly Gabriel Knight. Because there are a lot of authors out there who are great at uh, writing characters, but Jane Jensen uh, is probably my favorite out there. At least when we talk about adventure game, it, it, she really, cr she didn't write characters, she write people. Grace and Gabriel are so real that I'm still wondering where is Grace after all these years. I wake up in the morning and think, what the hell, where is Grace? I want to know. Grace? I'm right here. Anything else you'd like to say or like, uh, like any, any kind of any, any devs or games that you'd like to shout out or, or anything like that? One game I recently discovered, I think I played it this summer, is not a traditional point-and-click adventure, but it's narrative, and it's far, lone sales. It is a side-scroller, but narrative, and it has puzzles to solve, and it's very weird. It's a weird concept, just check it out. Uh, far, lone sales. Okay. But then we have so many games. I loved Crowns and Pawns last year. It was very good. I'm looking forward uh, for Foolish Mortals because that game is going to be very good. And we are about to have another interesting Kickstarter campaign in a few days. I think it was Death Corp. I, I have to be honest with you. I was quite surprised by a few uh, games last year. One of them was Justin Wack. Because I'm not into comic games. Most of the time they try to make me laugh and they fail. Justin Weck succeeded <laughs> for once. It, it was very funny and it had such a good game design. I was surprised by it. And another game, it's Lucid Dreaming. You know, when they had their Kickstarter campaign, I wasn't sure about Lucid Dreaming. Because it was filled with... Monkey Island references. I wasn't convinced, but I played it because, you know, it's a fellow there and I, and I thought, no, I have to play it. And I was so surprised because after you, uh, you play a, an hour or so, you discover that it's really good at writing. The game is great. It's got a strong narrative side that I didn't suspect when I played the demo. And a game design which must have been a real pain in the neck to write down because all the stuff with dreams and I don't know how we wrote that seriously and it was a serious surprise and I'm very very happy that I was wrong about that game. Um, I'd like to thank Stefano for his kind words uh, about my game um, and also say that I'm really glad that he finally decided to play it despite all his reservations. I know he's not the first person to be put off uh, by the idea of an adventure game which is filled with references to other games. Um, although I think the the demo 
probably gave a slightly over-exaggerated idea of how many there are. I think in the final game there's probably only about 20 references to other adventure games in total. Although there are lots of other things that people have spotted that they think are references to other adventure games, which were probably unintentional on my part. Um, I also, I love that um, Stefano thinks that it was a pain in the neck to write down all of the, the game design, which it almost definitely would have been if I was the kind of person who bothered to plan ahead and write anything down. Um, I didn't do that. I um, didn't have any kind of puzzle dependency charts or maps or plans or anything really. Um, but I did kind of make up that by <coughs> spending a very disproportionate amount of time at the end plugging leaks, fixing bugs, um, altering text for continuity purposes and generally trying to patch it up to make sure that it wasn't a complete mess. So it's not a method I would that I'm proud of and I would recommend to anyone else making an adventure game. Um, but it's sort of, yeah, it's it stopped me having to kind of plan anything out because I am terrible at organising anything. Um, I'd also like to say I am really looking forward to uh, Stefano's new game as well. I backed it on Kickstarter. Um, I'm looking forward to, to playing that when that comes out as well. So good luck with it. Okay, so 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 what what stage do you think like you're that you're at with the game, and 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 you think that uh, like you're looking for a release kind of you know sometime next year in 2024? If nothing goes wrong, I think the game should be ready for March 2024. But something will go wrong. <laughs> let's keep uh, let's just keep our fingers crossed. If, if nothing goes wrong, the game will be out by March 2024 because it's in a good stage. We have a lot of backgrounds at the moment. The game design is pretty much finished and it's cool. You you're going to have thousands of items in your pockets and uh, lots of location and characters to interact with is you know I, I when I design a game I always think about uh, Monkey Island 2 it's not one of my favorite games ever but when it comes to game design it's the point of the diamond I think the Chuck's Revenge was just perfect it had some flaws it had that damned monkey branch puzzle that nobody understood back then and, and think you're English, but outside of England, uh, non-English speaker, we, we solved that puzzle and thought, why in the world we just use a monkey as a branch? We have something similar in Italian, but it's, uh, we, we say parrot branch. Developing and publishing the first game, The End of Glory, was really tough because nobody knew me. Nobody knew as a, as a team, nobody knew the game, and you you have to constantly fight against this. You, you have to, 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 to earn the trust of people. And it's something that took me so long that uh, being able to finally see that there is a fan base, there is people believing in me and my team. I, I know that there's people behind me that's waiting to see what Lars or Alice will do in the next game. And I can only promise them that they're gonna do some crazy stuff in this second episode. It's gonna be more or less like the first game, but better in every regard, I think at least. I hope so.